Okay, so Privacy Pass. What is Privacy Pass? Privacy Pass is a lightweight zero knowledge protocol that's used on the web. And why was this invented? Well, first, I'm going to explain a little bit of context as to uh, where the idea came from and how it's applied. Uh, this boils down to um, where I work. It's a company called Cloudflare. Cloudflare is a service that sits in front of websites and web services and provides caching as well as uh, TLS, sort of encryption layers between the browser and Cloudflare, and then Cloudflare and, and your web server. Uh, there's a little tiny red blob right there with an X, and that describes uh, blocking. So one of the things that Cloudflare does is help prevent malicious requests going, from going to websites. And Cloudflare is not a small service. It's uh, used on, I, I guess at this point, something like 11 million plus domains. Um, uh, your m favorite cryptocurrency exchanges to the IETF, to uh, IBM, to Fitbit, to Eurovision, to uh, you're going to see a Cloudflare site if you're browsing the internet um, almost almost every day. And so, why do, does this massive scale and the property of protecting sites from attack uh, really matter? What what problems does does happen? What what comes about from this? And uh, specifically, um, there is quite a lot of malicious requests and malicious abuse online, and sites use Cloudflare in order to protect their service from things like comment spam, things, things like SQL injections, things like um, exploiting whatever the latest vulner vulnerability in the web application framework that they're using. And uh, preventing this at scale is a difficult problem. Um, one of the methodologies that was used for Cloudflare and has been for a while, although this is slightly changing, is to use IP reputation. And so when a request comes into Cloudflare, there's a database of IP addresses that have seen malicious traffic coming from them before. Uh, now, IP addre ad addresses are not a one-to-one -one, uh, from an address to a person, so it's not the greatest measure. Uh, but but yeah, so if, if something comes in from an IP address that has a bad reputation, you may have seen this, this CAPTCHA challenge before. And so this really actually disproportionately affects those who are privacy conscious, those people using VPNs, uh, anonymity ser services like I2P or Tor, um, they end up seeing these a lot. And as I mentioned, there's millions of sites that use Cloudflare. And when you solve one of these CAPTCHAs, you get a cookie. And one of the main principles of the web is that uh, different websites do not get to share information with each other uh, from, from the browser side. And so this web origin policy prevents you from solving a CAPTCHA in one place and using that to prove that you've solved the CAPTCHA somewhere else. So you're in, you end up in the situation where you see CAPTCHAs all, all around just for using some sort of privacy enhancing technology. So wouldn't it be nice to have some kind of online equivalent to cash that you could use to, to you know, pay your way through these, um, these CAPTCHAs? And it would be nice for these withdrawals and transactions to be unlinkable and uh, only sort of created by a central authority. And you know, that CAPTCHA vendors might allow you to spend this cash to, to bypass them rather than, say, identifying trucks or street lamps or, or things like this. Um, but cache isn't necessarily the best analogy, uh, although eCache was the first idea ar around this um, concept. Um, but if you, if you really consider the, the modern world and high definition cameras, cache can be tracked. There are serial numbers, and if there's cameras everywhere, you can see uh, if there's a back background system that tracks everything, uh, you can connect someone issuing a, uh, a bill and then spending it. So what you really want is something slightly different than, than cash. What you really want is, is kind of vouchers. And uh, I like to, to think of the idea as um, you take a sheet of paper, uh, you put a serial number on it, uh, you take a piece of carbon paper and fold it into the envelope and, and close it up. And then uh, this sheet of paper with the serial number is what you, the person who's going to spend the cash, um, has. You give it to a authority who then signs it uh, without having visibility into what the serial number is. Um, take it out, and then you're left with uh, essentially this legal tender for which the issuer does not have any information about the serial number. And 
this analogy is, is, I think, more apt than cash. And this maps pretty nicely to uh, a concept from the 80s, um, from David Chom, the, um, the idea of e-cash. And this boils down to kind of blinding. So um, a way to think of it is you take a token, you can take that token and put it into a state in which it's blinded, send it to the authority, who then signs this blinded token, sends it back, you have a signature over the blind value, you can unblind the signature and unblind the token. And uh, then later, uh, using the public key associated with that uh, party who signed it, um, this token and this signature are, are bound together cryptographically. And they could only have been signed by whoever had actually used the private key. And so uh, this, is, this is the basic idea. And uh, this is instantiated with um, RSA specifically blinded RSA. And uh, the, the math is relatively straightforward here, is you multiply by a random value that's exponentiated by the public key. And you can kind of go back and forth here. I won't get too much into this, but um, uh, yeah, once you, once you uh, redeem something that can be publicly verified using the key. And so this issuance of the cache and then the redemption of the cache are unlinkable. And this is, this is a property of the blinding. So after real-world crypto in uh, early 2016, there were several discussions of how we could potentially apply this idea of uh, eCash or blinded signatures uh, to solving Cloudflare captures. And um, two folks here, uh, George and Filippo, uh, sat down and, and wrote out an initial specification for how this could be done in terms of building a header that uh, could be used to um, issue cash in exchange or issue blinded tokens in exchange for solving a CAPTCHA and then redeeming them. Um, and so fitting this into the, the model before, you could think of this as, yeah, you take a token, you blind it, you send it to Cloudflare in along with a CAPTCHA solution, and you get a blinded token in response. And then the next time you see a CAPTCHA somewhere else, you can take that token to bypass the additional um, CAPTCHA. And this, uh, from the provider's point of view, is unlinkable. So there's no way to track whether or not uh, one person who solved a CAPTCHA on one site is the same individual who um, bypassed a CAPTCHA on another site. And so that's the end, right? This is, this, this is it. This is, um, <laughs> we, we put this together. Um, we hired Alex Davidson as an intern to build this and uh, submitted it to PETS, which uh, is the Privacy Enhancing Technology Symposium. And they rejected it in, in the need for more novelty and more real world deployment. So uh, we had almost finished deploying this and decided to uh, bring on some additional help in order to get this done. And uh, one of the one of the interesting things here was that this is RSA is expensive, and on the web we've recently made the transition from RSA to elliptic curves to gain a whole lot of efficiency. Maybe we could do the same sort of thing here, and so uh, we did pr a presentation, or at least um, uh, Val Sorda, Tankersley, and Davidson did a presentation at Real World Crypto to sort of ask for help. Like, how can we take this uh, ancient technique and move it into something modern? And Dan Bonet happened to be in the audience and uh, essentially said, weren't you watching the talk to before you? This is, this is, there's something called an elliptic curve OPRF. Um, and so in taking the idea of blinded eCash from, with RSA and actually moving it to something based on elliptic curves, there's two kind of inspirations that were combined together to make what eventually became the privacy pass protocol. One is um, the uh, OPRF construction, which is uh, analogous to blinding in a way. Um, a server can com com and client can together compute a pseudorandom function um, where the, the server does not get to see the output. Um, and then the other concept is a VRF, verifiable random function, which is uh, a random function that is provably computed with, by a server with a private key. And so taking these two ideas and uh, going through the literature and kind of matching things together, uh, the, the final result here was uh, what's called a batched elliptic curve VOPRF with redemption. And uh, George Tankersley was the one who really put this into the, into the pieces it was when we finally released it. Um, and this 
works by having multiple simultaneous OPRFs based on elliptic curve multiplicative blinding. Um, it has a VRF-like verification phase, much better performance than RSA, and uh, the DLEQ proof, which I'll, I'll sort of get into how this works, is more efficient. So there's a, there's a discrete log proof of that, that is involved for giving the verifiability factor of it. So um, some of the background here on previous work is uh, Friedman and all had the first const construct of OPRFs, which used a completely different um, basis than, than what Privacy Pass used. Um, Yoreki and all had uh, this idea for extending this for a private in set intersection, and then uh, the idea of a VOPRF that's almost identical to, to what we came up with uh, was in this 2014 paper um, for a PAKE, for secret sharing, essentially. Um, one of the other advantages that, uh, that, that we took advantage of was the ability to take discrete log proofs and batch them together. This came from Ryan Henry's PhD thesis. And uh, other work that was happening at the time included uh, Sharon Goldberg's work on elliptic curve VRFs, which is a, a current IETF draft, as well as um, the uh, Burns and all had this elliptic curve instantiation of an OPRF that was basically identical to, to the one that we used. And, and sort of as I said, this, um, this idea of Sphinx was yeah, presented at the, at the same time in the same session. And this uh, it essentially uses, is what we ended up um, using. So one thing to keep in mind when talking about VOPRF versus eCache is that eCache has a public, publicly verifiable property. Um, with VOPRFs, it's, real, it's only verifiable in the re redemption phase by the issuer, so it's kind of more like a uh, specific cache that's, that's used for, for, for one vendor rather than something that's publicly verifiable. So it's, if uh, anybody here is from Canada, Canadian Tire Money is, is the more apt um, comparison here. Okay, so for the rest of this time, I'm gonna actually walk through the, um, walk through the privacy pass protocol itself and different, different constructions and build an intuition as to why this actually works. And um, this is a, a esteemed group of, group of folks. This is very simple terminology relative to, to uh, some of the more advanced talks coming later. But um, I'm just going to set up some of the terminology first. So first, there's the idea of a prime order group. Um, we can denote this as capital letters. And you can think of points on um, a prime order group such as P256 NIST, NIST curve or um, a prime order subgroup of, say, an Edwards curve. Um, scalar multiplication, you can think of a scalar as, as, in this case, it's denoted by a lowercase letter. You can add to a point, add a point to itself n times. Very simple stuff. Um, uh, there's a feature called hash to a group element, which uh, takes a scalar and outputs a uniformly random element of a group. This is uh, really important for some of the security properties of the VOPRF. And the last piece is a discrete log equivalence proof. Um, which is a very short zero-knowledge proof that's simple to compute um, that proves that two pairs of points are, uh, have the same quotient, basically, that they are different with each other with respect to the same scalar. So P and P times S is, the same, or is as different as Q and Q times S. Um, and so this is going to be denoted DLAQ P to, to P to R equal equals Q to S. This is like your SAT analogies. All right, so with these things in place, here's the first insecure scenario for building um, uh, something like Privacy Pass. Well, first, you, you, um, the client, in this case, is trying to talk to a server to um, solve a CAPTCHA. So the client takes a point on the elliptic curve, um, called a point T, and sends it to the server. And then the server applies a secret scalar and sends it back. Later then, the server, the, uh, t in order to redeem this, the client presents this point, and then the point is multiplied by the server's, point, server's secret. And then um, this allows the server to validate that this was actually computed. So um, it takes T, multiplies by S, checks that this value is the same, and says, great. And so this is, this is a very, very simple um, uh, redemption system. But in this situation, the server knows T, so this is actually not linkable. Um, T in the issuance and T in the redemption are the same one, so linkability is a problem. So how do you fix that? 
Well, um, you introduce a blinding factor. And in this case, rather than just sending the point itself t, you take a random scalar b, blinding factor, multiply it by t, and then send it to the server, which then exponentiates by s, or I guess you should say multiplies by s in the group and sends it back. Uh, then you divide out by b and send t and st back to the server. And so this, these two uh, pairs of, of uh, points are not linkable to each other. So you, you get the unlinkability, but you do end up with a different problem, which is malleability. Uh, and is in this case specifically, you can just take any random multiple of both t and st, and they will be different by a factor of s. And so therefore, you can kind of mint as many tokens as you want. As you want. This is not good. How is this solved? Well, by introducing this one-way hash. So rather than picking an arbitrary point, t, what you can do is pick a string that you can hash in a one-way manner into a point value, and then send that value as t. And so you can blind that value, send it to the server. Server can send back its version. And then in order to, to verify the redemption, you sent, it actually does the hash into the point on the curve, multiplies by its secret value, and checks. And uh, that's great. So um, in this situation, because you can't actually compute a pair um, that with, without breaking the hash, without actually finding a pre-image of the hash, uh, then there's a unique pair t and st that you can send. Um, so this, this is great. This, this is going a lot further along the way. And you have uh, redemption hijacking as a problem here. So um, you could, if, if this was a clear text protocol or something, then these values are not something that uh, if you send it, send it along, someone could grab it and associate it with a different request. Uh, so this is something that you might want to fix. So how do you fix this? Um, well, uh, what you can do is rather than actually sending the, um, to the signed token point here with the, the unblinded, the um, S times T, you can just uh, send an HMAC of a message that you're binding this token to and have the key to that HMAC be S of T. And because uh, the server takes the lowercase t, maps it to t, maps it to st, they can compute the same key. So this becomes an implicit binding. Um, so what is the problem here? Well, if you're in a situation where the server might be maliciously trying to tag you um, and, and identify, there might be a different s that you use for one person than you use for everyone else. Uh, so this is where the, the zero knowledge proof comes into play. Um, you need to use the same s for everyone. And so at the very beginning of the scenario, what you can do as a server is publish um, a group element and a group element that is raised to the secret value, and then a discrete log proof that, um, that the same s was used uh, when, when computing this new token. And so this is, this is great. This actually is pretty much along the way to what the final, final thing in privacy pass is. But in order to um, get some addi additional properties, such as um, you know, solving one CAPTCHA should give you access to 20 or 30 or 50 pages, um, this only gives you one redemption. So what you can do here is um, just do multiple of these at the same time. This is scenario six. Uh, but this has the problem of bandwidth. These, you're doing a DLAQ proof for every single one of these tokens that you're doing. So this, this one might not be great. Um, and this is where the optimization comes into play of a batched DLAQ proof. And uh, just using the fact here that you have uh, a commutative uh, multipli multiplication here, you can kind of factor out the S and have a single DLEQ proof. But um, this is kind of this naive construction here of just having a single DLEQ proof of the sum of all the points is equal to the, the sum of all the results actually doesn't work. You can, uh, as, as, a, as a server, manipulate this so that um, uh, this addition doesn't work out. And so um, you can result in bad tokens. So the, the, the final step, and this is actually, this is it for, for privacy pass. This is actually the, the full description, is that you can do a proof over a linear combination, an unpredictable linear combination of these points, and um, call that C1, C2, C3. And you can take that by just hashing all the values that are known to all the pieces together. And, uh, and then you're left with this one single DLAQ proof and all these tokens. And so 
this is basically it. That's it for the protocol. Um, and Privacy Pass itself uh, was released. So this is something that we actually built and is, is included in every capture that you see through Cloudflare. Um, and there are Firefox and Chrome extensions, over 130 or so active users, 130,000 or so active users, uh, redeeming you know half a million of these per week. And yes, we did eventually get the uh, the paper published in Pets um, with Ian Goldberg as as an extra author who really helped out on some of the proofs. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this this is something that you can dry out, um, and it's. It's in JavaScript and it's running on Cloudflare's Edge. And so there are some challenges here relating to double spend. Uh, so if someone were to farm a lot of these tokens, um, there's no real, because it's, it, it's, it's uh, difficult to detect where someone has actually issued a token from by design, uh, you don't have the ability to, to check for, you know, someone amasses a large amount of them. So uh, essentially we're working on time sharding, uh, so rotating the, the, the public key, which is very difficult because uh, in order to get a consistent view of what the, um, the, the G and the, the SG are, um, you need to, as a client, be able to get these updates. So these are challenges, but, but looking forward, we're actually integrating this with more capture providers. Um, and the fact that I mentioned earlier that the VOPRF is not publicly verifiable, it's more like a voucher than cash, makes it so that there are some federation challenges. So uh, issuing a token from one provider and verifying it with another is not something you can easily do. Um, but uh, that's, that's coming along. We're also exploring, with promising results, a quantum safe VOPRF based on lattices. Uh, that research is is yet to be uh, yet to be published because it's not not confirmed yet. But um, in terms of standardization, VOPRFs this is submitted as a, an internet draft to the IETF and is is being reviewed right now and being considered for adoption. And um, there are a lot of other applications of this idea beyond CAPTCHAs. So you could think of anonymous session resumption for TLS is one thing we've considered. Um, you could have an anonymous referral code mechanism. So if you wanted to have an application for which uh, you can have someone give a code to someone else so that they get a discount, but you don't want the uh, system to know who the super spenders are, in this case, the, the people who are actually doing sending out the most referral codes, you can build something like Privacy Pass uh, in for this. This is used um, in the Brave browser, uh, something derived by pri from Privacy Pass is used for ads and ad tracking in a privacy preserving way. And uh, in essence, Privacy Pass gives you one single bit, and it's a really cheap single bit of zero knowledge. So you could apply it to things like, am I over 18, or am I, am I a citizen of the EU, and, um, and other applications of this sort. Okay, so with that in mind, um, that's, that's sort of the end of the talk, and I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> any questions? Yeah. Remember to say your name. Hi, this is Atarshi. So uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, the privacy pass being implemented between a client and server, right? So, but how does this uh, fe the federation take place? For example, if there is one client and one server, and then there is another, uh, the same client going to another server, right? Or any combination. So, is there some sort of federation happening, and uh, how does that work out? Yeah, so the federation is something that we're currently working on for the next version, and uh, the way it would work is that the browser extension itself would have a copy of different um, public keys that correspond to different providers, and uh, if one provider wanted to use a token from some other provider, they would have to call into a verification API at that other provider. Um, so uh, it can be used in, in two ways. Um, issue from the one provider and verify with the same provider, or issue with one provider and verify with a different provider, um, given that those providers have a, a back-end channel. Thank you. So I think we, let me just double check. We do, have, okay, sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, let's take more questions offline, since we do have break. So let's thank the speaker one more time. Thank you, Nick. Um,